This portrait is of John P. Munn at the age of 18 and he was born in Grangemouth in 1892. As can be seen from this 1910 photograph, John was one of a family of six children. Apart from the period 1914 to 24, when he did his army service and worked in the shipyard in Leith, Edinburgh, John lived and worked all his life in Grangemouth. Indeed, the house in Jackson Avenue was the family home for 80 years. Initially, John was a shipping clerk, eventually becoming head of department, with Rankins, later to be Gibson and Rankin. He retired in 1958, but then sadly died the following year. This photo, dated around 1946, shows John, his wife Jean, son Ian and daughter Shona. It is Shona who is key to this story, as it was she, in 2002, who donated to the Falkirk Library Archives John's collection of 4,000 negatives, 300 slides and many prints. There were so many quality images that David Elliott of Falkirk Archives, whilst researching images to show social and economic changes in Scotland, put together a selection of over 100 images to create this book, Summers Lang Sign, Scotland 1930 to 1959, which was published by Falkirk Council in 2005, but is now sadly out of print. But I'm getting ahead of myself because, as part of my camera club researches, I first encountered J.P. Munn in a 1935 Falkirk Herald piece on the first annual exhibition of the Falkirk School of Art Club and Photographic Circle, a pre-incarnation of the Falkirk Camera Club. This article reported on the fine technique and authentic wintry feeling of John's winter afternoon. Soon, a visit to Falkirk archives led me to finding and acquiring the image seen here, and also discovering David Elliott's book. Incidentally, they are haystacks, not houses, in the distance of this photograph. Furthermore, I was given access to the archive's many J.P. Munn mounted prints, and discovering, by means of stickers on the reverse side of the mounts, just how successful John's images had been, nationally and internationally. So this show will focus mainly on these successful prints. For example, on the reverse of A Winter Afternoon was this sticker, showing that the print was accepted in 1936 for the second annual Scottish Amateur Photography Exhibition. However, John had had prior success in 1935 with this image, entitled The Sunbather. This was accepted in the 1935 Scottish National Salon at Ayr. Now, this image appears to be somewhat risque for 1935, but appearances are deceptive, because this lady is, in fact, a small china doll. The parasol was made by John with a matchstick as its handle. This non-competitive image was taken by John to reveal his deception. For those too young to remember, the coin is a half-crown piece, worth about 12 and a half pence in today's money, and had a diameter of 32 millimetres. Here are some more of John's pre-World War II successful images.
Meanwhile, John was still exhibiting with the Falkirk School of Art Club and Photographic Circle, as this review, in December 1938, shows. Whilst his exhibits received the praiseworthy comment, have all a professional touch about them and are really excellent photography, the piece unfortunately does not give any image titles. Incidentally, as well as being a Falkirk Photographic Circle member, John was also, at this time, a member of Grangemouth Photographic Club. In 1939, John gained an acceptance in the 31st Scottish Salon at Kilmarnock with this image, entitled, on the front, as Sandy Lone Bean Cross. Curiously, the reverse gives the title as The Village Street. The Falkirk Archives have similar images dated 1936, entitled Bean Cross Village, Shona Walking. Clearly then, this is his daughter in this picture. John had another image accepted in the salon that year, and it was this one, entitled An Old Courtyard. Now, this image has an interesting backstory. John usually took his family to Fife or further north for their holidays, and many of his images are from these holidays. However, in August 1937, he was persuaded, by Shona it is said, to go to the borders. This in the days when they, like most folk, had no family car, and so travelled by bus. They ended up in Eyemouth, where this image was taken. John, like many a photographer, took many images in this fish yard, where indeed the courtyard was. But, before we proceed, note the single barrel behind the cart. This image, Sunbeam in Fishyard Eyemouth, being another such. I wonder if this had been taken on a timer, or did John deliberately have the woman just exiting the frame on the right? And could that be himself in the doorway? Furthermore, note the two stacked barrels. So someone, presumably John, had, in the previous image, removed the top barrel to vary the composition. He'd also removed that distracting object from the top of the stairs, as well as the upturned brush next to the barrels. Another image from this location is this one. This is a gleam of sunshine, and although I don't have a sticker to prove it, it too was probably in the 1939 SPF Salon. Why do I say that? Well, because in 1939, the SPF selected 50 images to be sent to America as a Scottish photographic touring exhibition. And, as the reverse of this mount shows, this was one such chosen image. The dates on some of the 20 stickers range from 1939 to December 1942. Perhaps the USA's involvement in World War II curtailed this tour, or perhaps they'd just run out of space for more stickers. The stickers show that the image was seen mainly in mid and east coast USA, with a probable highlight being the World's Fair in New York in 1940. One note about John's war years. Apparently, he had foreseen the likelihood of war and bought a significant stock of film prior to the war and which was not available during it. It is said that John took many portraits of children and loved ones to be sent to the serving troops. Unfortunately, none of these portraits seem to have been included in his legacy collection. I now have three final pre-war images to show, which, I believe, illustrate John's tremendous observational and photo-compositional skills. Firstly, this image, taken around 1920, shows his sister, Margot, in one of Grangemouth's not infrequent floods. John was later to use his photo-documentary skills as a photographer 
for the Greensmouth advertiser. Next, look at this image, also taken in Eyemouth in 1937. Well, actually, this is not John's image, but this is. And photographically, what a transformation into a superb image. Lastly, how about this photo of a lamp lighter? Believed to be taken in John's own home street. Probably not an uncommon image in 1937, but again, it wasn't the image John took. This was. Talk about a Cartier-Bresson decisive moment. John clearly managed to make this grab shot into a tremendous image. After the war, John continued his photographic hobby, but I have found no evidence of any further competitive success beyond 1939. Nevertheless, John continued to contribute photographs to the now renamed Falkirk Art Club, and this 1952 report, albeit littered with a critic's verbosity, indicates that his works still reveal the superb craft of the master of long standing. The image referred to is this, swords into ploughshares. The structure you see is the remains of a hangar of the old Grangemouth Airport. A year later, in September 1953, and this report tells us that visitors will be impressed with the pleasing viewpoint in Inverness. And the Sign of the Times, which is actually just titled Sign of the Times. My researches have not revealed whether John joined the East Stirlingshire Camera Club in 1953 or if he was a founding member of Falkirk Camera Club in 1958, although I suspect not. However, he was still taking photographs as John, never a car driver, bought a car in 1958 for the family and Shona became his driver. Sadly, before he had had any real chance to utilise this new mobility, John P. Munn died early in 1959. That then is my take on the work of local amateur photographer John P. Munn, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little of his story and seeing those successful images of his. Remember, if you want to see more of his photographs or even wish to learn a little more of his life, then do look at David Elliott's book. And finally, my thanks, as usual, go to those helpful people in the Falkirk Archives in Calendar House.